Well, first off, I will say that uh, I'm your host here today. My name is Sam Watson. I am the Academic Outreach Specialist here at the NNLM Greater Midwest Region. Uh, we're located here in Iowa City at the University of Iowa. Um, we have today, uh, our presenter is gonna be Stephanie Swanberg, who is a librarian uh, at the Oakland University William Beaumont School of Medicine in uh, Rochester, Michigan. And um, I'm just gonna kind of wave here. You can kind of see, hello, here I am. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off my video just so that I am not a distraction here. Um, and you can see Stephanie here too. She will take it from here and I will let her introduce herself. So thank you, Stephanie. All right, thanks so much, Sam. Um, I'm also going to show or hide my video in just a second. I just wanted everyone to be able to see me and um, say hi and Happy New Year. So I'll go ahead and turn that off now so that's not a distraction. So um, thanks to Sam and the GMR for inviting me to um, come and present today as part of the Kernel of Knowledge series. Um, I'm considering this as kind of a show and tell. Um, very informal. Um, this is going to be covering a brand new health information literacy partnership that uh, we developed here at OUWB, which is the shorthand for our very long school name that um, Sam just mentioned. Um, and just kind of the lessons learned, things that we didn't expect to encounter, things that worked really well, and I'm hoping everyone can take something away that they might be able to use at their own institutions. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with that. So today I'm just going to briefly go over um, just some background things. So how are we as a library defining outreach as outreach is defined in a lot of different ways um, at different institutions. Uh, we developed a model of outreach here at our institution called the Integrate Partner Create Model. And then I'll just be going over what exactly we did in our pilot series. Uh, which happened this fall, and going into, again, what did we take away from this and how could you as audience members potentially use that to either establish um, a new partnership or improve upon an existing partnership that you may have with one of your local public libraries. And just as a note, I do have a couple of opportunities just to stop throughout the presentation um, to answer any chat questions. So um, when I have those, I'll pause and just let everyone ask any questions. And then at the end, we'll have time for questions as well. Um, so just a little bit of background, because um, you've probably not heard of our school. Um, we are a newer medical school. We um, welcomed our charter class um, in 2011. And unlike our name, which sounds like we might be either in uh, California because of the Oakland part or in Rochester because of, the, or in New York because of the Rochester piece, we are in Rochester, Michigan, which is about 25 miles north of Detroit. Um, we're affiliated with a large local hospital system called Beaumont Health System, and our affiliated university is Oakland University. So we just merge that all together into what we just shorthand as OUWB, which makes it a lot easier. So again, we started in 2011 with just 50 medical students, and we've slowly grown our class by 25 medical students since then. So we're now up to 125, and we're going to stay that way because um, that's as large of a class as we can accept. And then in 2015, we received our full LCME accreditation. So we have been around now for three years as a fully accredited medical school. Um, and one of kind of the unique things about our school is our focus on community engagement which was one of the reasons that we as the medical library wanted to pursue partnerships with local libraries to really work with the school's community-focused mission and contribute to what they were doing. So I put a link in here um, just as an example. We have a Center for Community Engagement, which the shorthand acronym of that is called COMPASS. And this is a center within the medical school that really handles all of our outreach, the medical school's outreach to local communities. So as soon as the school opened and we had students, we really wanted to encourage students to give back to the community. So since the school opened, we've had, I think we now have over 70 partnerships with local 
nonprofits um, in many different areas, um, schools, um, local professional organizations, um, local food banks, um, anything you can think of the school has made um, connections with. So I'll get into a little bit later how we took advantage of that as the library as well. So for me, um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of idea of where I'm coming from and what our medical library looks like. So I am one of four um, librarians on staff and we also have um, three staff members. We primarily serve first and second year medical students as well as about 40 basic science faculty that are located here on Oakland University's campus. We also have 1,500 clinical affiliated faculty at Beaumont that we do outreach to in terms of faculty development sessions, um, but we primarily work with those on campus. Um, myself, I've been here since June 2011, so I started right before our charter class did um, in August. So as you can imagine, when starting a new medical library, uh, you turn into a little bit of a jack of all trades. So um, I mainly do instruction, uh, both within the curriculum um, as part of research training and evidence-based medicine training. And I also do instruction with um, our faculty members in all sorts of things. But I also have taken a lead in doing our outreach and advocacy initiatives, including marketing the library, marketing our library resources, um, event planning, exhibit planning, and then this piece that I'm talking about today is kind of our new initiative, which is reaching out to local public libraries. And on top of that, we just do what everyone does. We do research consultations as our medical students have to all do a research project as part of their four-year program. We also do that with faculty. And then we serve as liaisons to various um, courses within our curriculum. And we are also faculty members in the School of Medicine as opposed to the library. So that, that comes with all sorts of um, various responsibilities in terms of committee work and um, expectations for presenting and publishing. So that's just a little bit about us um, and myself and where we're coming from. So as a medical library, what does our outreach program look like? So as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, outreach looks really different at every library. Um, some consider it just outreach to your primary population on your campus or at your hospital or whatever your primary patron um, population is. So that might be students or faculty or clinicians. Um, we wanted to take a more broader perspective um, as well, because some people say, well, outreach is really just with anyone outside your institution. So we really want to be inclusive of both groups, both internal and external. So I really like this definition um, that came out a few years ago, and I'll read it to you. Um, at its most basic level, the purpose of library outreach is universal, to reach as many patrons as possible in an effort to inform them about authoritative resources which may be beyond their awareness or means to access. This came from a publication from 2013 that looked at what US academic libraries in general were doing in terms of outreach. But I really like this definition because it is inclusive. It's not, well, we're only working with external users or only working with internal users or only with these populations. And that's where kind of we came from in terms of who we wanted to outreach to in our initiative. So um, we also created a model to kind of describe how we were approaching outreach and what we were doing. Because we were a new medical library in a new medical school, it's really challenging sometimes um, to be able to balance, well, we have to do all these other things. We have to develop our collections and integrate into the curriculum and figure out our role in various aspects. How do we actually tackle outreach on top of all of this? Um, but because our school is so, um, because they so focused on outreach, we really wanted to be a part of that. So this evolved over the last seven or eight years. So it did not, we did not have this model right off and said, okay, we're going to use this from here on out. This really evolved. Um, and we call it the Integrate Partner Create model, um, which we published uh, recently in Medical Reference Services Quarterly. But basically, it's kind of a three-pronged approach where in one hand, um, we integrate into existing institutional activities, which I'll, I'll get into in a second. 
Uh, we can partner with other groups on campus or individuals, which can help kind of balance the amount of time and effort and maybe funding that we're putting into things. Or we can create library-driven initiatives where we are the primary drivers of the outreach. So let me give you a couple examples of each of these. So in terms of the integrate, so where someone else, either another group on campus or at the medical school, has already developed a program. And we are literally just coming in and tagging along and we don't really have to do much in terms of the program development or management or anything like that. So two examples of this at our library, um, we have been participating in the medical school's summer enrichment programs for middle school students as well as high school students. Um, they have several programs going here at the medical school, but we've mainly been focused on a health sciences career program and then a research program for either senior high school students or uh, graduating um, senior students. So this has been where basically the program is developed by, in this case, it was the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And we come in and we do maybe one or two sessions that are specific to information literacy or um, searching the literature, organizing the literature, um, how to search for health information, uh, using Medline Plus, something like that. We also have tagged along to our school's community health fairs, which they do anywhere between three and five times a year. And this might be at a local school, it might be at a local church, um, and we are one of many tables in those community health fairs. But it gives us an opportunity to participate without having to really put a lot of time and effort into it because we're not managing those programs. We are coming in and being able to do that. With the partner, aspect of our outreach model. It's a little more um, time, time involved, mainly because we aren't just tagging on, we aren't just uh, going in and doing one-shot sessions or something like that. We are either partnering or co-leading something with someone. So in the state of Michigan, um, there has been a movement that started at the University of Michigan um, called Michigan Libraries for Life, which is an organ donor registration drive. Um, this started at Taubman Health Sciences Library at U of M back in 2010, and they've now grown it to about 140 libraries in the state. And so we, we tacked onto this program um, as a library, and it then turned into other opportunities. So one of our medical student groups approached us after we had done it just as us for two years, and said, well, while you're trying to register people for the organ donor registry, what if we tried doing it on bone marrow as well? And so we said, okay, that sounds, that sounds great. And so that was a case where uh, we were already partnering with a state-led um, initiative to do the organ donor drive. And then another group on campus approached us and said, well, how would you like to partner to do this? And so we've now done this for seven years on our campus and done the combined organ and bone marrow registration drive, which because Again, things are not totally in our, our field. We don't have to be doing everything um, in terms of the planning process. And it does take a bit of planning, but it's not as much as if we were doing it by ourselves. We also partnered with um, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the medical school to host a series of diversity dialogue talks, which this started literally the second day I started work. Um, back in 2011, I just happened to meet the Director of Diversity and Inclusion, and she was interested in doing some educational programming. And from there, we turned it into a small team of medical students, faculty, myself, and her, and developed it into the series where we basically would bring in outside speakers to talk about a current issue in diversity or health disparities or something like that. And these were hour-long talks. They were open to anyone in the medical school. And we eventually opened it up to the campus as well. So again, just another case where the medical library is partnering, partnering with someone else um, to put something on. And now, what, I, what the main kind of feature of this whole talk is about the create. So things that we as a library are driving. So. One example of this is we've been bringing in the NLM traveling exhibits, which is somewhat a partnership too, because we're partnering with the NLM to bring them in, uh, but creating um, either 
accompanying exhibits or events surrounding these. So we've been the major driver on campus if we've done any events and all of the time and effort and planning has been with us, the medical library. And then again, we're talking today about the health information literacy partnership that we've now created with public libraries. And that's an example of create, but it really has now turned into a partnership, which I will get into in just a second. All right, did anyone have any questions? I just wanted to stop for a moment um, about kind of our background and how we got into outreach and the model. And I'll kind of monitor the chat. Oh, hey, someone's from Michigan. Hello. <laughs> All right, well, I gave people a few seconds, but I didn't see anyone. I didn't think that one might have a lot. Hope I think someone's oh, question, yeah. All right, uh, how much buy-in do I have from my supervisor? Uh, complete. <laughs> um, our library director is um, very um, supportive of any and all outreach activities that we do. Um, and I'll get into a little bit about this um, with this particular initiative that we've been doing with public libraries um, but we have she's very open to allocating a set of our budget to go to outreach initiatives which um, of course helps because funding is always hard to come by um, so she is completely supportive of that and because we are supporting the institutional mission of reaching out to communities I think it always has been very um, supported all right, second question. Uh, is funding associated with the CREATE section with the NLM traveling exhibit? Uh, so no, so with the traveling exhibits, um, we pay $200 basically to ship it off to the next institution. Um, so that's the only payment that is required for that. Um, but we do not, we don't get funding for that. It's just internal library funding that we use to bring those in. And that is all that we have to do. Um, what did you do to reach out? Um, so it, I'll get into this a little bit with this particular um, project in a few minutes, but I would say for the most part, all of our internal things have been happenstance where we've been in a meeting or we're just having an informal conversation in the hallway with someone at the medical school and we tend to just come up with, oh, you're doing that? Well, we'd like to join in on that or something like that. In the case where we've established something and then someone has asked a partner, it's usually been through an email or something like that. Okay, well, we'll keep going and then I'll, I'll answer questions as we go. So let's focus in on uh, this health literacy partnership that we've established, which I'm gonna call, we started it as a library initiative and it's now developed into a partnership with various people at the medical school as well as with our public library that we are partnered with. So as with any initiative, we really needed to have some goals in mind for what were the benefits to us, the medical library, to the public library that we potentially would partner with and to the community members. Why were we doing this? So for us, the medical library, really the purpose of reaching out and working with a public library was we really wanted to kind of get an idea of how could we be mutually beneficial to each other? Um, how could we raise awareness of both our resources um, that we have, as well as raise our own awareness of what's available at public libraries that we might be able to um, work with? Again, because our school's mission was very focused on educating and engaging the community, we really wanted to tack onto that and be able to um, support our school's mission. And then because of that, our school is always looking for additional opportunities um, for community service. And so we thought, well, maybe there's some opportunity for us, the medical library, to create community service opportunities, not only for ourselves, but also for our medical students and our faculty staff, which I'll get into. So from the public library perspective, 
I mean, in approaching them, we really had to promote, okay, what's in it for you? Because we don't want it to just be one-sided. So we really wanted to emphasize that by partnering with a public library, that we could show them what we as a medical library could potentially have in terms of sharing resources and services. Also making them aware of free quality online health resources, such as all of the plethora of NLM resources that are available that they may not have been aware of. And then just have the public library be able to increase their own educational offerings to the community in health and health information topics. And then from the community perspective, we also wanted to be able to raise the local community members' awareness of NLM resources and just free quality online health information, because um, that's always a challenge for anyone is to, it's not, I can find something, it's can I find really good information when I go online. And we also wanted to, in turn, be able to have community members be a better advocate for themselves in terms of being able to improve their health information seeking behavior and then also potentially their health. So that was kind of our goals. So how this start hit, I'll get into that in a second. Um, our initial team was myself and my director, um, her name is Nancy, and it was literally just a one-on-one -on -one conversation of, I'd really like to do this, and this was kind of my driven initiative. Like, I wanted to go out, I wanted to partner with um, public library. We also have a couple of um, faculty and staff members on the team that are already doing things in the curriculum related to health information literacy or promotion and maintenance of health. One is the epidemiology faculty, her name is Victoria Lucia, and another is a director of education training. Um, her name is Rose, and she works mainly with the Compass Group, which I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, and is kind of the main driver between making these connections between community groups um, in, in the local community and the School of Medicine. So that was kind of the initial team, and I'll get into how we actually did this now. So just to give you an idea of how long did it take to really get this off the ground, um, I would say about a year <laughs> from the initial conversation that we had in 2017. And again, we have been thinking about this since the very beginning, but we really didn't jump on anything until last year. Um, myself and Nancy were at one of the school community health fairs, and a couple of the, of the other Compass leaders were there, and we just really were having an impromptu chat while we were sitting there in between um, community members coming and talking to us. And it was just like, okay, well, how do you typically get started with approaching um, local organizations since you've been doing this for the medical school for so long? So that was kind of the initial chat. In January, I set up a planning meeting with the same Compass leaders and just talked about, okay, so what, what's your typical approach? What's required in terms of the School of Medicine? Do we have policies that we have to complete? Um, do we have various things that we need to comply with in order to create these partnerships? Which I found out, yes, um, the School of Medicine requires an affiliation um, agreement form be completed with any community organization. So there were some of these um, kind of back-end bureaucracy things I was not expecting. Um, but out of that meeting, um, I basically came to the conclusion that, okay, this is great, because we've got people here at the medical school that are willing to help us with this. Um, they're willing to provide us with advice or help us reach out to these communities. So from that meeting, I already had a target library in mind, which was um, a very small library in one of our underserved communities. Um, that was only about a 10 minute drive from our library. Um, and I sent an email to her, just a cold email, um, kind of describing that, hi, I'm so-and-so, you've actually worked with some of the um, librarians at our university library before, and I'd just like to know if you'd be interested in chatting more about potentially doing some educational opportunities at your library. And I got an initial email back within about two days saying, yes, of course, that sounds great. And then nothing happened, <laughs> which I think is fairly common when you're starting to approach people. Um, either they get busy, and this is this is pretty much a solo public librarian, um, so I was not surprised that this kind of fell through. 
Um, but it was a little disheartening. Like the first time it's like, ah, so excited. And then, ah, okay, it's been two months and I haven't heard from her. Um, after trying to call and a couple of follow-up emails, it's like, okay, I give up. So <laughs> in March, two months later, I decided, okay, well, first library is probably out. Let me try a second library. And the Auburn Hills Library was my second target library. They actually live literally across the street from the university, so it's a very convenient location. And they already have some reciprocal relationships with the university. So for example, um, students at the university can get a library card, even if they're not a resident of Auburn Hills, the city. So I thought, okay, this might be a, a great way to um, just kind of get in with the local community. So again, I sent an initial email to their library director, um, which I have to say, it was hard to find their email to begin with. <laughs> so if I had thought about it back again, I probably would have done a cold call um, as I had to go fishing around to find their email, um, not even through the library, but that's another story. Um, and I sent the same almost exact email to the first library director. And within about two days, I got an email back, same as the first one, which was, yes, this sounds great. Um, let's talk about it more. And we ended up having a phone conversation a couple weeks later and really just kind of getting an idea of what I was thinking, um, what they would be interested in. And that was really the start of it. Um, and I thought, this is great. Like I found uh, a library director that's really interested and sounds like we're going somewhere. And then I didn't hear anything for another couple of months. And I thought, okay, here we go again. Like maybe I'm encountering the same problem. Um, but I figured, okay, I'll, I'll just let it go and see where it goes. Well, turns out in um, July, I got a follow-up email from two of the librarians at the public library. And it turns out the library director that I had talked to on the phone left um, about a month after I had chatted with her. Um, thankfully, before she left, she was able to touch base with these two librarians. And one of them had literally just started the week before. So I think they were just waiting for the new librarian to start to contact me back. So it really was kind of in their hands and I'm happy that they followed up with me because um, I, I don't know if I would have again if I hadn't have heard from them. So in July, um, we had an initial meeting which um, ended up being here at the medical library across, since we're right across the street. I was gonna go to them, but then they had a power outage and decided to come here. <laughs> So all these little funny things happened. Um, but I met with both an adult services librarian and a children's librarian. And that was just kind of the first meeting to talk about what would they be interested in? Who's their patron population? What do we think their interests are? What potential program ideas um, had we thought of? And I already had a list that I kind of shared with them of ideas that I had talked about with their library director. Um, so we just kind of hashed that out um, at that July meeting. And from there, it just kind of naturally progressed. Um, so the public library was more than happy to complete the medical school affiliation form that we had to complete with them. And vice versa, we had to complete a volunteer form because we would be considered volunteers um, in their eyes. So on both sides, we had to fill out a little bit of um, like paperwork just to get this going. And at that point, I had been, again, talking with people at Compass, our community center group, and um, the faculty member that was I'd already been working with in the promotion and maintenance of health course. And she said, what would you think of seeing if some of our medical students would be interested in working with you on developing some of this, um, some of these educational opportunities? And I said, sure, that'd be great. We'd already worked with medical students and some of our other um, initiative, so it didn't seem odd at all. So I emailed the leadership of that group um, about potentially working with them to develop some of these educational opportunities, and they were all for it. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an idea a little bit later of what this turned into. Um, and also in August, we had a couple other things that happened. Um, I went to the public library and basically got a tour of the library, what their educational facilities looked like, and talked about um, finalizing what our program topics were gonna be for this pilot series. 
And while that all happened, I also met with the medical students and also with um, the Compass group again to kind of talk about, okay, what dates are you guys available to do this and exactly the activities for each program. Because I'm not an expert in doing children's education programs or things like that. So I had some help with some of this and I'll, I'll get into that in a second. So in September, um, our medical student group actually started recruiting volunteers to help um, facilitate these sessions. And I also recruited a few faculty volunteers to help as well. And again, I'll get into that in a second. Uh, the library, the public library, uh, advertised the programs to their patrons for us. So we did not have to handle any of the advertising. And then I did a lot of the program activity finalization and then again my director gave a very nice kind of starting funding like a little bit of funding to allow me to purchase supplies uh, so that was not in the planned budget but she said this is a great initiative so I will allow you to use a little bit of our money to purchase supplies and then in October we launched the pilot programs which I'm sure you guys are really interested to hear now what those were so this is what our final team looked like. So I went from having just the two of us, so myself and Nancy kind of discussing this, to meeting with some of the faculty and staff at Compass that are involved in community engagement, adding a partnership with a student interest group, and then also recruiting some faculty uh, from the medical school to help with our programs. And then of course we have from the public library, both representation from adult services and children's services. So this is really a team effort. Um, so that's why I say we definitely moved from this was a library initiative to this is definitely a partnership now where we are working as a team together. Um, so I just wanted to now go into what did these pilot programs look like? Because the timeline kind of implied a few things and I wanted to show you exactly what these were. So our first program was the first in what we're now calling our Healthy Hot Topic Lecture Series. And the adult population for this area is uh, mostly older persons. Um, so the library wanted topics that would really target them, things that would be of interest, things they've heard in the news. So the first one, um, we collaborated with Gina, the adult services librarian, to figure out, let's focus on the flu and hepatitis A, especially with the hepatitis A outbreak and all these things in the news. So this was going to cover pretty much everything related to the flu, hepatitis A, and their vaccines. And then we also went over how to locate free, reliable health information, and we demonstrated Medline Plus and CDC. And this was a 60 minute session, it was on a Saturday. And we only had two participants, which are the ones you can see here. Um, it was a very lovely husband and wife who lived just down the road. And they were very health literate, so they had already, they searched for health information online, but they never heard of Medline Plus and were enthralled with it. And I also recruited um, an emergency medicine physician from our affiliated hospital to co-instruct this session with me. Because of course, I'm not a physician. I, I mean, I could basically go in and talk about myths and facts related to flu, but I thought it would be more impactful if we could actually get a physician to come and talk. Um, this was actually after reaching out to five different physicians. So it took a lot of back and forth to try to get someone on a Saturday when they're already busy clinicians to come in and talk, but she was very gracious and um, loved doing it for us. So. This one was really a nice pilot. I'm, I am sad we only had two participants, um, but there are things that came out of this, which I'll be talking about kind of later. The second program that we did was a preschool healthy story time. So most public libraries do story times and we thought, wouldn't it be great if we did a health related one? So working with the um, public librarian, um, she said that she thought, and again, I gave her a list of kind of ideas. She thought germs and hand washing was a perfect one. And the medical school had already done some German hand washing activities at these local health fairs that I had talked about earlier. So how this worked was we actually had two sessions. We had one in the morning on one day, and then we had one in the evening in another. And this was really a partnership. So 
the children's librarian led 15 minutes of the story time. So they read these two books, Germs Are Not For Sharing and Wash, Wash, Wash Your Hands, and did some music, because you can see the Wash, Wash, Wash Your Hands has some music with it. And then after that, we did tie-in activities that were led by the medical school. And this was everything from draw your germ, which literally was, okay, let's have um, kids draw what they think a germ looks like. And where do you think they live in a house? So we printed out a poster basically of a cross section of a house and where do you think germs live? And then we had them go through a UV hand washing station, which is this picture at the bottom. So um, this is called glitter bug. And basically what um, the kids do is they will cover their hands in basically a lotion and put them under the UV light. And it's supposed to mimic germs and where you see germs. Then they can see, okay, let me go wash my hands. I've washed my hands, I come back, I look under the UV light again, and oh, I've missed between my fingers, or uh, I've missed around my nails. So it gave them a chance to really look at how they're hand washing. And again, these are preschoolers, so it's a little like herding cats, but <laughs> um, they seem to really enjoy it. And so, because of the medical student schedule and where the typical story time is for the public library, um, we led the morning session. So we being two librarians, myself um, and Nancy, and then two faculty members. Um, one was an epidemiologist um, that I mentioned earlier, and another was a microbiologist. Um, so they, they had experience in this, and they were interested in coming and working with kids on teaching them about germs. The evening story time, because it was in the evening at six o'clock, our medical students could participate in. So they were the ones that then led the kids through the various um, hand washing stations and having them draw a germ. So it was a really great partnership between not only the public library and the medical library, but also bringing in medical students and faculty from the School of Medicine. And here's just a couple of pictures from the German hand washing one. So I'm in the bottom uh, left corner with one of our kid participants and they're drawing a germ. Um, right next to me are the two faculty members that participated. And then above that is our five medical student volunteers. And then on the far left is Caleb, who was one of the um, children's librarians at the public library. And just kind of as a little fun thing, we created a germ buster certificate that the kids could take with them at the end. Um, so again, just kind of wrapping it all together. So, And they were really cute. Um, the public librarian had them, um, all the kids that participate, sign basically a thank you letter to us. So this was their thank you letter. And in terms of participation, we had 14 kids in the morning session and seven kids in the evening session. So I think it was a really great turnout in terms of this, because trying to corral 14 kids is a lot. We'll just say that. <laughs> OK, um, the last program that we did um, was a STEAM session, so a science, technology, education, arts, um, medicine session. And this was part of a new program series that the public library had started called It's Elementary. And it was meant, it's meant for K through third graders just to give them an introduction to um, something, something educational. So um, they had done dinosaurs and space and some of these other things. And we thought this would be the perfect opportunity to come in and do a health related activity. So we chose Eat the Rainbow. Um, the public librarian thought that would be a really great topic to talk about nutrition. And again, this was one hour in the evening, 5 to 6 p.m. And what we did was a 10 minute kind of introduction. So we had a video, we talked about overall, like what do you think it means to eat healthy? What are some good things that you can do? And then the rest of the hour were stations where the, the kids would basically go station to station. And we had stations for um, each of the food groups. We had a iPad game that we found from the CDC called Dining Decisions. And then we had them build their own healthy sandwich, um, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, and so the facilitators for the session were myself, um, one of the children's public librarians, and then five medical students. 
So these pictures just give you an idea of what the stations look like. So in the upper left corner are two of our medical students talking about um, Eat a Rainbow of Colors. And I was really fortunate because, again, um, the Compass organization had already developed this board that has Eat a Rainbow of Colors, and they had the sticky things that I could bring in already. So I didn't have to buy supplies for this except for printing out um, a few my plate um, pieces of paper and buying the food. Um, we also had iPads through the library that we check out to students. So I just grabbed three of those and we took them to the public library as well. Um, and then in terms of the make your um, own, make your own my plate, um, we just had to ensure both from the public library standpoint and the medical school standpoint that it was okay to serve food. So from the medical school standpoint, as long as everything that we bought was prepackaged and we didn't do any handling or processing of food, that was fine. And then from the public librarian's perspective, she said, yep, it's fine if you bring food, just have an alternate for any kids that may not want to eat it or that may have like an allergy where they can't eat a certain food. Um, so we did have to ensure that we were meeting all of um, like the legal and other policies from both libraries on that end. And we ended up having eight participants, um, eight kids um, for this session, and they were super engaged and loved it. Um, and you can see kind of in the back, we also had an information table here that parents could take. So we brought in some Medline Plus magazines. We brought in some Medline Plus swag so that they could take those with them um, when they left. So we were really trying to promote healthy information to the kids. Okay, um, I will go through the feedback and then I'll stop for questions before I go into the challenges. So just how, what, what did we get from the community? So you'll remember we only had two participants in that first Healthy Hot Topic session. Well, turns out they really enjoyed it. Um, I actually got a phone call from um, the gentleman here, his name's Bob, and he's like, well, we live at the senior center down the road. Um, would you be willing to come in and talk with our senior community about these resources? And I said, sure. Um, he was really funny. He's like, I can put 100 people in the seats. I'm like, that's great. So um, haven't nailed down a date yet, but they are still very interested in doing that. So I think we hit the mark there. Um, from the kids, um, again, you saw kind of the, the fun little thank you letter they sent us. but. Um, this was a quote from one of the third graders on our Eat the Rainbow session. His name was Edward. He's like, oh, we already did this in school. Do we have to do this again? That's what he said at the beginning. At the end, he's like, this was so much better than what we did at school. I think it was mainly because we fed them, but <laughs> um, it was still fun. Um, but again, from a third grader, that's nice feedback to think, ah, at the beginning, they weren't so excited, and then by the end, they were. And then from the medical students. Um, again, we had 10 total medical students that volunteered between these, um, between the two sessions that they participated in, and they are already spreading the word. They, they told a couple of other people um, in their class about it, and they want to know how to get involved, and then they want to know if we're doing more this semester. I said, yes, we are, definitely. So the medical students are really happy to be able to come out and educate kids in the community about that. And because of that, we have an entire series planned for this winter. Um, the library invited us back. The medical student interest group we're working with has been um, on board with everything. So we're doing two STEAM programs. We're doing one in a couple weeks on the human body, and then another one in March on exercise. And then we're repeating the German hand washing at what the library is debuting as a family story time. So typically parents leave their kids, and then they, they go off and do their own thing. Um, but this is meant for all families and parents to stay. And so it would be teaching the kids along with their parents. And then in terms of the adult topics, we're looking at doing a second um, hot topic lecture in March on pain management and the opioid epidemic. And I'm actually partnering with one of our pharmacology faculty members. She's a PharmD. Um, at our medical school. So we're currently planning that session. All right, I'm gonna stop there um, before I go into lessons learned and I will um, open up the chat so you guys can ask me questions.
All right, I see a couple of questions. Let's see, I'll answer the couple questions that were already in the chat for now. So does your way of reaching out typically depend on the type of partnership or organization? And what's your go-to method of reaching out? Um, so yes, I think it does depend on the organization that you're trying to reach. Um, I think especially with the public library, this was a new type of thing for us. We'd mostly done internal partnerships with either medical student groups or other um, on-campus departments. And so we have a very small school, so we really had an in from the beginning there, so we didn't have to do a lot of digging. Um, with the public libraries, I think there's definitely a lot more hesitation because they, I don't think they want to feel like they're being um, taken advantage of, that this is just another check mark on um, the medical school's list, or this is a library that just wants to say they've done something. Um, so I think there's definitely a little bit of hesitation there. So overcoming that and making sure that there's something out of it for both, both groups. Um, so I think we've done a really good job of making sure that we're creating programming for the public library that really is meeting their target populations and that they find um, engaging. Um, so yes, and I would say my go-to method of reaching out, um, I guess in terms of creating that first contact, I'm much more of an email person. <laughs> Probably if I was a phone call person, it might be a little more successful, um, but then I don't like cold calling people and trying to get an answer out of them right away either. So I like to give them a little time to think about it. Um, so my presentation, yes, um, I will send out a copy after the presentation. I have given Sam a copy of the slides. You guys definitely can have those. Um, how did the program benefit the medical students? Was it based on their learning curriculum? Um, so for the medical students, they do get what are called um, Compass Community Service Hours. Um, for participating, which again, this is through the school Center for Community Engagement. Um, it's basically a tracking system that the students fill out how many hours they have spent volunteering. And this information could be used from anything for um, students receiving awards. So for example, our student awards group looks at how much community service they've done when looking at um, student performance. Um, eventually, this might become a service learning activity that's a, not embedded, but that's kind of tagging with the medical school curriculum. Um, our school is really looking at increasing the number of formal requirements for community service. So right now, I think in one course, medical students are required to do five hours of community service. Um, so this would be towards that. Um, and then eventually, we're looking at this being more of a formal, okay, Auburn Hills Public Library or any other public library that um, the school is affiliated with is another opportunity for you to go out and um, use your new, we call it medical student as educator skills. So they are taught how to educate in the curriculum. So yes. Um, what type of disclaimers or permission did you have to obtain from the NLM to promote or use information about their products? Um, none. Hopefully I don't get a slap on the hand for that. Sam, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but we get all of our promotional materials from the NLM directly. Um, because we are a um, NLM GMR affiliated library, we're able to order um, promotional materials, including bookmarks and um, information placards and the Medline Plus magazine and things like that um, to use for things exactly like this. Um, so um, that's how we've been able to promote, and then we just literally do live demos. Um, as far as permissions, I'm not sure if there's really a permissions that I'm supposed to do. So <laughs> Sam probably be a better <laughs> answer of that question. No, I, I, yeah, I think you have it right. We, we do offer um, uh, order form on our website if you're looking for actual uh, material, brochures, posters, those kind of things. Um, I'll I'll put a link to it in the chat box. But yeah, we we just like to people to spread the good word about NLM resources. So that's really the only restriction there. Perfect. 
I'm doing it right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the great questions, everyone. Um, we are running low on time, so I'm going to continue um, with our lessons learned. So in terms of the successes, um, I, I think I've come across this whole presentation that this is really a team effort. It's not just me as a single person or just the medical library doing it. Um, we really have had buy-in from both the School of Medicine and from our local public library. I'm not going to guarantee that every public library is that way. Again, I tried another one and it just didn't work out. Um, but having that engaged team, everyone that really wants to be involved and make this a success has really helped us do that. We also have a lot of existing resources um, on hand. So with the Compass Center of Engagement, that gives me access to expertise in terms of people who, again, we have a director of education training who has developed these a lot of these activities already. Like I literally borrowed the Glitter Bug UV hand washing station. I didn't have to buy a new set myself. Um, it would be nice to do that though because they're always using it, and so if there's a chance that someone else needs it and I can't get a hold of it, then I'm kind of um, in a problem area. But um, for now, it's worked out well to be able to um, have that expertise and borrow some of the supplies. We've had to buy things, um, simple things like um, paper supplies, stickers, um, markers, um, printing costs, um, copies of the books, things like that. So we have had to buy a small number of things. Um, and we're hoping to increase that um, later. Um, in terms of the medical library, again, myself was very interested in doing this, and then I have a really supportive director who has been involved herself, but was also willing to give us a little bit of pilot funding to do this, um, so that may run out eventually. <laughs> um, again, it costs money to do these things. And then again, because the public library has an existing program structure with their story times and with the um, K through third grader um, STEM program, they already had these things in place and it was literally, oh, why don't we do a health related one? We didn't really have to do anything new except with the adult health series where they hadn't done something like that before. Um, so having the public library have those has been really um, great. And then they have a very loyal patron base. Um, the public librarian knows pretty much all the kids by name that comes to the story times. So she's really established a rapport with them, um, and that helps just promote us and what we want to do. There have been challenges, and I've alluded to these um, throughout the presentation. Um, it's hard just to get started um, getting buy-in. I mean, I'm very fortunate to have a director that's um, giving me support and a medical school that is very um, concerned about the health outcomes of the local community and wants to educate and be engaged. Not every medical school or hospital is going to be like that. Um, so um, being able to find others that are available, I mean, for example, it took me five different physicians to finally find one that would co-teach that um, first workshop on the flu and hepatitis A with me. Um, so it takes a little bit of back and forth. Um, and again, finding a, a partner public library that is available, interested, and consistent, that, that, that's a challenge, I think. And then time and effort. Um, this is only one very small component of my job, and all of those pilot programs happened in one month, so that was a crazy month on top of everything else happening. So um, it definitely is a challenge to maintain that engagement with all the other things going on, not only for me, but um, our medical students who, of course, they're going to medical school. They have exams. They're trying to pass the step one exam. Um, they're trying to get through their curriculum. So it's hard, um, but it's very rewarding, um, and I think it's paid off so far. Um, and again, that was a pilot. We'll see how it um, goes in terms of sustainability. And then, of course, there's the sustainable funding. Uh, right now, of course, the public library really does not have any funding to um, promote um, these or add to what we're doing. So we've all, up to this point, used internal medical library funding to fund this. And then again, borrowing supplies and borrowing expertise from the medical school. Um, so that's always um, a challenge. So just to wrap up, uh, my advice to other libraries would be, if you're 
planning on pursuing a new partnership, um, whether it be with a public library or another um, organization, do expect to have some setbacks, but that's okay. It, it's just about consistency and keep trying. Um, there is a lot of time and effort you do have to devote to first just establishing the partnership and then maintaining it. Um, I mean, literally, it did take a year from me having this, okay, let's really start doing this, to we actually did a pilot series. So it does take a long time, and it tends to ebb and flow. <laughs> so there, are, there is that. Um, and don't be afraid to follow up. I will admit, that's, that's a weakness of mine. I tend to think, well, if they haven't followed up within uh, a month, then they're probably not interested. Maybe I'll try someone else. Um, or if I'm following up, maybe I'm nagging. Things happen. People forget. Emails get lost in inboxes. It's, it's okay to just follow up with a phone call or another email, and that's it. That's, that's all I would say. Don't be afraid to. And then, again, this is not me doing this all alone. I've had so much support from um, other people in the medical library, from the institution, from the public library, and I can't imagine having to do it all by myself. It's, it just would not be possible. And, again, going back to our model that we've created, see what your institution is already doing. Again, we didn't start out doing something like this. We started out by integrating into community health fairs and doing things that our institution was already doing. So that really helped us establish that, yes, we, the medical library, are interested. Um, but um, we didn't have to do everything. And then, again, finding partners has been really key. And I would say just getting yourself out there if you're in a committee meeting or if you know of medical student interest groups or if you know of another department on campus or maybe your university library um, or another local hospital library, someone that's interested. And then finally, like, yes, you can start off by creating something, um, but be willing to share it. Um, it just helps so much to be able to share the expertise, the time, and the resources to help manage something like this. Um, it's definitely something that's hard to do by yourself or by the medical library. Okay, um, I will stop there, and I'll check back in the chat again for questions, because I saw a few pop up. And I'm, I'm just going to jump in here too, Stephanie, yes. <clears throat> since we're at the hour, I know people may have other things on their schedules. Um, you can find the, the link to the survey for this webinar. We'd like to hear how we're doing with these kernel sessions and how we can improve. Um, it also is attached to the MLA CE credit. There is one credit hour available to you for attending this webinar. So feel free to follow that link, take the survey, um, and get some credit if you're interested, um, because we, we'd like to see how we're doing. Um, and again, Stephanie, if you're able, are you willing to stay a couple minutes if people have questions? Beyond yes, that? I am. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll stick around here for a little bit to see if anyone has any follow-up questions for us. All right. And I'll just kind of comment on um, the last thing, which was not much was discussed on grants. Uh, you're absolutely right. And that is kind of the next on our list. Um, we would like to investigate GMR or other grant opportunities that could potentially be used to fund this um, make it a sustainable program So you're absolutely right. I didn't touch on that because we didn't do any grants yet, but that is on our docket All right, and um, I just encourage everyone if you have any questions follow up with me via email via phone I'm more than happy to share my experience um, I shared a lot of nitty gritty details today, but I hope they were practical for you. Um, but again, I'm more than happy to share um, anything about our experience that you may have questions about. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel. Select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.